Okay, we're now going to move on to our first plenary session of today called Making Safer, Smarter and Healthier Cities. And in it, we're going to address the questions, what are the key ingredients when it comes to making healthier cities? And how can urban leaders create policies that cre encourage new approaches to security? So um, I'm going to hand over now to a chair who's going to um, take this session. Amelia Size is the Deputy Secretary General of United Cities and Local Governments, Barcelona, and co-chair of the Gender Programme of Cities Alliance. So please give a warm round of applause to Amelia Size. Good morning. Make a sign if you can hear. Oh, I can hear myself now. Hello. <laughs> I am very, very pleased to be with you today. Good morning, everybody. Very impressive audience. I've got a wonderful huh? panel for what is a very complex session, as you have heard from the title. We are going to try to cover many things in this session. And allow me to just introduce to you um, a, a couple of concepts that you will hear then later on from the speakers. My panel is composed of cities, cities from three continents, Toronto, yes. Lyon, and Surabaya. And then we've got friends of cities, uh, two key partners of cities around the world, General Electric and Huawei. So we are going to be talking about the challenges that cities face, but we are also going to be talking about the partnerships that we need to address some of the challenges that we have. Allow me to share with you the very special moment that cities are going through um, in the international arena. I, th I feel, I, I work with United Cities and local governments. We are the biggest global organization of cities, local and regional authorities. We work around the world and we have something like 260,000 members, okay? And we have been working at this for 100 years. Toronto and Lyon and Surabaya are, are key members and founding members of United Cities and local governments. For the last decades, we have felt like the international community has discovered cities. Finally, they are understanding how important cities are, how important local government is for development. And this is a very good feeling because finally we feel like our opinions matter for the international agenda. But sometimes they are, we, we, we feel also that people are paying attention and maybe not for the right reasons. I mean, sometimes we feel as global network that national government come to us when they haven't been able to solve a problem themselves. And so usually it's very late and there are many challenges. We also feel that sometimes you've got the private sector that wants to give us solutions that might not be so adapted to what we want to do with the citizens. And that some, sometimes our problems are perceived only as technical problems, when in fact, challenges that cities face are much more complex than just technical solutions. And I think that part of the debate is especially important now, here, in this type of Congress, because this Congress is not only a Congress of cities, by the way, we are thrilled to be a key partner of this Congress and to have so many of our members attending this edition. But um, this Congress is also about talking, well, what does IT, new technologies, mean to us, means to local governments? And how do we make sure that those new technologies are used to the advantage of the commons, of that public goods that we all share in a city? And this is why I'm also so happy that we have this combination of panelists, because I am sure that the city representatives will share with you their challenges from the perspectives of the community needs, and you will also hear from the private sector with good intentions and great ideas how they think we can partner. So without further ado, I'm going to just give the floor 
to the first speaker. We're going to have a first round of presentation and then an interactive session among, among the panelists. And then we are going to invite you to use the application to ask the questions that you would like uh, to ask. So you need to connect to Wi-Fi, download the application, find the session, and then post your question. And hopefully, I will see it in my screen, and I will pick one or two of them. OK, does that work? Make a sign, because this is such a cold room. Are you happy with this format? Yes. OK, so there we go, Toronto. Right, Please. thank you very much. Can you introduce to us what your main challenges are in this context that we just described? Absolutely, and thank you for that opportunity. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rob Miko, CIO of the City of Toronto. Distinct honor and privilege to be here. A little context, the City of Toronto is the largest city in Canada, the fourth largest in North America, with 2.8 million people, over 140 ethnic uh, backgrounds and languages that are spoken, very diverse city. The exciting thing about Toronto is we rank literally in the top 10 in nearly every global city index from livability, opportunity, health, and safety. Actually, most recently in the 2017 Grosvenor uh, Resiliency Report, Toronto was ranked number one out of 50 in terms of cities that are most resilient. I present that to you to share that um, at the same time, the McKenzie Global Institute report shares that the top 600 cities in the world are responsible for 60% plus of the GDP worldwide. And even though we're a large city, uh, number one in, in Canada, fourth in North America, we cannot get complacent. So our opportunity is, how do we continue to build capacity so that we are resilient? And in building capacity, we can't settle for where we are. So we also face challenges with a growing and expanding multicultural city in terms of areas of transportation, housing, making sure we're addressing social uh, inequalities and economic inequalities, and ultimately not losing our focus. And our focus is to improve the quality of life for the people that live, work, and play in the city of Toronto, through economic prosperity, social advocacy, and environmental sustainability. So we've been recently focused on our resilience plan in terms of where are we today, but where do we want to go? And our resilience is really twofold in 21st century approach to resi resiliency. There's the acute um, shocks that hit our system. A couple of years ago, we had a major ice storm that really tested our system. There's things that are being introduced as we talk about things like smart cities, technology that's all over the city, so we've got to prepare ourselves for po potential cybersecurity attacks. Mm -hmm. So we've got to prepare for acute, but also keeping our eye on chronic in terms of looking and making sure we're closing the social divide, making sure that we're not creating a digital divide. So in all of our aspects of looking at driving smart city solutions through technology and data, making sure we're closing that social divide. And then finally, utilizing data to solve the root of problems. We've figured out something that we can't just solve the symptom of the problems, but in using data that's produced through the city, data that's produced through the ecosystem of the city of Toronto, which includes our global partners, how do we use analytics to really drive to the root of the problems to continue to make Toronto prosperous, but also continue to make it resilient, continue to make it an attractive place that people want to live, work, and play. And so that's us for the city of Toronto. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it's wonderful to have a speakers that stick to time and are able to tell it all in less than the three minutes you, you, you were provided. Thank you very much. A very interesting point you made is, Rob, that actually you can be rated the the, the most resilient city in the planet, and you cannot stop working because this is not one thing that you do one time and that's it. But your city is evolving, right? So, absolutely. So what 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 would you let us think for the next round okay. and tell me in, in one sentence now, because you, you had some time left, okay. um, what is your main concern for the future? So you want to build this resilience around data, but what are you thinking the main challenge will be? Is it the growth of the city? Is it the housing situation? What type of challenge are you looking at? I think it starts with making sure we have a laser-like focus on our city indicators. Okay. And with a focus on our city indicators, the one thing we have to look at as a large urban center is making sure we're driving social inclusion social okay. equality and creating economic opportunities, because if we don't, we create a threat for our own city. Rob, we'll make sure we'll come back to that. Okay. So, 
Karen from Grand Lyon. Um, I think that the previous speaker has touched on something that is also very important for you, as we were commenting just before, just before the session. It's, it's, it's about social inclusion. It's about uh, looking at problems before they happen. What else is Lyon trying to do as Grand Lyon, but also as city of Lyon? Eh? Because it's two, it's two administrations that you are representing here. Yeah, that's correct. I'm both deputy mayor for the city of Lyon and also vice president for the metropole of uh, Lyon. So we try to make things more uh, simpler than, than it used to be in France. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And I have to say that that's my fourth time. And I'm especially happy to see that for this plenary session, we are half uh, of the group that's uh, with a political view, which I think is much better than in the past, because we used to have in such, you know, debate and discussion regarding smart city, the point of view of uh, public stakeholders and company, which is great, but it's certainly not enough com if we consider the the challenge that we have in, in, uh, in front of us, which is, uh, I think we're all in agreement to say that what is next for us is a world of cities. And, uh, um, and uh, the city are both, you know, uh, where the challenges are concentrated and also where the solution can be designed and, and, and shaped. Uh, we also see that this smart city movement has rated te technology as a top mind uh, solution for the city transformation and as a key driver to build a desirable city. But what a smart city is first is a city. And um, when you, you say that, uh, that means that you need first to have a global vision and a global approach, even if today we have to take into consideration what the new perspective are thanks to technology. But beyond all that, uh, a city is made of population, is made of cultures. A city is first, you know, uh, made by people, and it's our main concern as a city. The second thing is that when you see this wave of new technology that are just incredible, because we are experiencing an incredible period of uh, transformation uh, with large horizon, that, that's great, but um, uh, this led to standardization. And I think that what is, you know, the main concern for a city, and that's our case in Lyon, is to create um, something unique, a lifestyle that is honed, and to leverage the city transformation, uh, the urban transformation, to generate innovation. Because that's a crucial thing, to generate innovation. And this innovation is not just a topic for, again, uh, research or uh, company. It's something that we need to, to make it happen together. Uh, so regarding this smart city question and, you know, what is at stake, I think that first we need to, uh, to place a political dimension as a first thing, just because, you know, a city is a very complex ecosystem. You have to deal every day with paradox. You have to deal with people that love tech, but as well the people that hate tech. Yeah. <laughs> and when you're talking about social inclusion, that's really, uh, you know, uh, our deal. We need to make happy everyone and to anticipate also aspiration and expectation of people as a whole, not just for few of them, mm -hmm. but as a whole, what make your, your city. And the last point that I would like to make is that technologies is certainly not a final, final, finality. We need to first de de define how you want to live with that and where you're going to, because, you know, as a political leader, we need to give one direction to make globally everyone working together. That's our concern in Lyon. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. So is, 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 is actually conquering technology instead of letting uh, technology conquer us and making sure that, your com that the needs of your community and the, the way that the community <coughs> is looking at, at the smart uh, influence the way that you innovate in Lyon. That's what you are looking at. So okay. in the second round, we will hear your priorities um, around linked with technology. Yeah? So departing from the political priorities that you have for your community, but then uh, linked, linked with, uh, with technologies. Thank you very much.
much. So I, I come now to our first uh, private sector uh, partner at, at this uh, round table, let's say. Um, yo, how, you see, I'm sure that you have experienced in your bones how the city's evolution, the city leadership evolution has been around the smart. I mean, we notice it in this Congress. I think the very first Congress, the very first edition of SMART which was much more about solutions, technical solutions, than this, this other approach. How, how does your company, uh, how we uh, try to adapt mm. to, to, this, to these changes? And what type of solutions are you proposing? Okay, uh, let me share uh, some of the experience that we have. I think today from a ICT infrastructure provider point of view, I'd like to share with you uh, the experience that we have in the last uh, three to four years. Because the smart city started probably three years, four years ago. Uh, a lot of talks before, but nothing have had, has really happened just until recently. Okay, so I travel a lot and talk to like uh, political leaders, government leaders, CIO, CTO, uh, talk to them about smart city, preaching about how they should be, how smart city should be like. They all come with the same question all the time. What is the concept of smart city? So I finally come up with a definition of my own, which is I would say that smart city is a systematic process of re-engineering of your society operations by by adopting new, uh, by adopt, adoption of ICT, okay, to create new methodology, new processes, to enhance the livelihood of the citizens, to improve the management capabilities of the city, at the same time, uh, industry upgrade, uh, business transformation to improve your business com competitiveness so that they can make more business for, for, for the society. Now, Huawei's proposition this year, or in the last few years, uh, have not been changed. But this year, we stress on the fact on leading new ICT to create a, uh, a nervous system for the for the city. Now, what it really means for the uh, 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 our proposition? What does really mean by nervous system? That is to have the city be connected with everything, everything at the same time uh, to provide the capability to sense, to predict. Uh, to respond, okay, to whatever is happening in the city by, of, of course, I mean, uh, by a lot of technology like IoT technology and also enable the government to make decision, good decision support to respond uh, 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 actions, appropriate action at the right place at the right time. Now, we had, um, in the last, in last year, 2016, we did about $4 billion of business in, in, safe, in smart city, including safe city already. And so today, what I really want to do is share a lot of experience, okay, of how to implement a smart city or safe city uh, together to make city become safer and smarter and healthier. Uh, there's some methodology behind, behind it. I'd like to share with you with some of the few cases we have. And what are the key elements, okay? What are the key elements? What are the common uh, successful factors they all have in common? Okay, I'd like to share with you with all this. Um, and then... The, probably run out of time, but I would also like to share, but some people ask me, and I also, also want to share with you why everyone is talking about a uh, nervous system and what makes us become unique, right? So I'd like to mm -hmm. also share with you today uh, what makes us unique and why we are uh, doing extremely well in, 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 the next, uh, in, 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 in the smart city and safe city. The Thank growth you, rate though. that we have... You will need sorry. to wrap up this part of... Okay. Okay. <laughs> Last thought? The growth rate that we see in, 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 our, in, in our business is 40 to 50 percent on an annual growth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much. I think you will need to pick what you want to tell us in the second round. You will not be able to tell us everything okay. that, you, that you've planned, but uh, just pick one example maybe for, okay. for the second round. Mayor, Mayor of Surabaya, thank you for <coughs> being with us. I guess for you also accessibility to new technologies is very important and the data that you get from it. Can you identify with, with what has been said? Yeah. So thank you very much for inviting me and having me here in this panel. So Surabaya city is the second largest city in Indonesia with total population of around 3.3 million people. With this big number of population, then we have an initiative to make all the process of uh, the governance and public services starting from administration using information technology. 
So starting from the management and operational works of the city government, also for the licensing, for education services, the health services, also for the city security, and <coughs> many other things, uh, including the waste management, even including transportation management, also for the security or using information technology. And because we're using this IT, we can enjoy a great number of saving, around 20 to 25 percent of our annual budget. And also because of that, uh, we have more transparent and more accountable government services because uh, our public can also see things uh, transparently. Also for the education service, for example, the, teach, uh, the teachers can also have a direct contact with parents through the system. Also in health services, we have uh, the IT system to help with the registrations, including the medical records of the patients, all using technology. Including for the city security and traffic management, so we have installed uh, cameras all over the city. Also for the flood management, so it's also using IT because the Surabaya is located only five meters above sea level. So we, we use uh, the IT in all these uh, programs and it can be monitored directly by the public. So if in case of any problems uh, happened in the CD, we're also using the information technology for the people to directly report to us, for example, in case of uh, natural disasters, even up to the domestic problems. So our community uh, also communicate with us governments using technology. And now we have around 600 programs <coughs> delivered uh, using technology for the public. Therefore, we're preparing around 1,900 free Wi-Fi spots all over the city. Also, we have 43 broadband learning centers. That is a facility used by the people to access any services from the government. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, here you see the difference between different parts of the world. I mean, a, a, um, a local government that wants to provide advantages on IT that are mainly based on uh, connecting to Wi-Fi or to internet solutions will need to invest in Indonesia in guaranteeing access first. I mean, this is something that other parts of the world are not experiencing in the same manner. And, and I think it's, it's something something very, 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 very important to take into account when we offer that type of solution. How does your company deal with that, Austin? How does General Electric look at that when uh, you talk with partners like, like Surabaya and other parts of the world? What is your key solution? Absolutely. Thank you very much for being here. I'm Austin Ash, the general manager of GE's Smart City Business. And we see a really, really exciting, interesting opportunity for smart cities unlike we've seen in the past 10 years. And it's really about harnessing the power of IoT. Things are getting connected, right? Our personal devices are all connected. We're starting to see our cars getting connected, all the equipment around the world is getting connected, and cities are getting connected in a big way, much like the mayor was saying, through Wi-Fi and other technologies. What cities are trying to un uncover is a solution that enables them to scale these types of solutions across the city. And we know a few things about where cities are at in smart cities adoption. First of all, we know that budgets are constrained, right? We know that resources are constrained. We know that these technologies are complicated and there are a lot of different options. And so what General Electric is trying to do is build a platform, an IoT platform that allows the city to very cost effectively scale a nervous system across the, across the city by, ex by enabling open data to be available to both city operators and as well as the broader community, you can change the civic engagement model. 
You can change the way city officials think about data, the way that the citizens interact with data, and that becomes a shared medium of experience that can drive outcomes. When we th think about optimized traffic and parking and environmental adverse weather response, public safety, the health of the community, it all revolves around the streets and the sidewalks of the city. And so by being able to put your finger on the pulse of that city at any given moment in time, you can actually drive an outcome. You can actually change the experience of an individual, no matter what their socioeconomic status is. And so that's what General Electric is doing and working with cities across the globe, specifically starting in the United States. We've worked with the city of San Diego, who's deployed 3,200 of these smart sensor type technologies, and they are changing the way that they do business in, in the city. They're changing the way city operations work. It's a very horizontal approach. Think, think about all the silos that are in a city and how each budget is kind of aligned to those goals and those prerogatives. And then think about what would happen if there was a shared resource that all of those departments could leverage at one moment in time. How much money could that save the city? How much faster could that help them enable new technologies and new services, new citizen outcomes? And that's what we're enabling in San Diego and also in the city of Atlanta. And as we continue to grow, we're only three years old to date. Our business just turned three years old in, in October. But as we continue to, to learn and grow this business, we foresee um, this applying across every region of the globe. Well, thank you very much. This is another big evolution that we see um, in, the, in the discourse. Uh, we seem to be talking a lot about connections connections between things. I mean, policy is, is not about sectors. And yet, most of, most of the way we do policy, also internationally, the international agendas are very sectoralized and very much seen in silos. If you look at the sustainable development goals, well, you have 17 goals, and there are many links between them, but it's still quite a lot of, quite a lot of silos. So um, how do we overcome that, actually? I mean, I see that our narrative is changing. Changing. I see that the solutions that we're looking at are changing a little bit. Do you think that addressing the use of data in a different way is going to be something that can help you for, for to address this kind of connections between the different silos? Um, and also, I would like to know, what, what would be your key uh, concern now in terms of security and health for the city in relation to this? You, you think right. you can manage that? Yeah, you, you, pack, you, you pack quite a bit in there. Yeah. Let me see if I can <laughs> unpack it for you. Um, you know, the reality is cities around the world are facing, they've got to be globally competitive. Citizens and businesses are demanding service excellence. And as we heard earlier, a lot of governments, cities like ourselves, were turning to creating digital government to realize operational efficiencies, drive service excellence, reduce costs, identify re revenue opportunities. In approaching that sort of digital government perspective and thinking about a digital citizen, that creates an opportunity for us to rethink even democracy and how we engage with citizens, right? Instead of just the people coming to a city hall and we're delivering information and services, we think about our citizens are now globally. I'm here in Barcelona, we have citizens all over the world that are still engaging with government. I think that's going to force us, that has forced us as a government to look at things differently. Instead of our service areas, we have to look at it from a citizen's perspective and a business perspective. And what that has done is fostered a different thinking. It's more user and citizen centric, but it has also put some healthy pressure on disruption on regulation, legislation, and even policies and procedures. Mm. And in order for us to evolve and mature as a digital government, we got to really think about some of our existing legislations and regulation. One example for us where we had to embrace disruption was the whole ride-sharing economy. So the Uber X's of the world showed up in our city, mm. very disruptive. <laughs> We had a choice, we could shy away from that, and globally cities are faced with this challenge, but instead the innovation actually occurred in the regulation. We had to look at regulation, legislation differently. We actually had to turn things literally upside down. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, we fostered a different level of engagement that ultimately drove some service excellence for people in the city of and Toronto. And that you could connect back to your resilience plan? I mean, is that Absolutely. That On that example, is a great example mm -hmm. of connecting. So in changing innovation around the regulation, 
What we ended up doing is now they're fully regulated and monitored so we can ensure public safety um, and other things associated with that. But what we've also done is taken innovation to feed innovation. Mm -hmm. So all the trip and ride information and data from all the drivers, over 50,000 private transport companies, that's fed back into the city. So Good. now we as a city can take that data, we can use that to feed into our transportation and analysis mm -hmm. and patterns and see how people are moving throughout the city and foster different innovative solutions in our transportation space. Thank you. Do you identify, Vice President, with this type of approach, a very integrated approach to all the challenges that you face? Or we're, is it something we're absolutely in alignment with that. I think that the main thing is that the approach itself had changed and we, we have this reverse move where now we, take, we take the perspective of the citizen and the users of the city, but more than that, we try to empower the citizen to make the city with first. And it's not anymore the local government that orders the city and say, okay, we have to do this project and so on. We create this bottom-up effect constantly it's for everything. It's the but for that, yeah. you need to to create uh, the right condition. And the right condition starts with uh, good governance. And it's a, a role that y your role um, has to change. You, you are here to, be, to enable you know, the forces of your, of your cities, to create a smart city a maker's community, to make things happen, to make sure also that um, collaboration is a new standard and you never give room for one project that is led by only one actor. Uh, that all projects that you, la you launch are um, uh, large enough to go beyond the innovation strategy of a single stakeholder mm -hmm. and make sure that you generate the, the right environment uh, for a public-private population partnership and make things together. So today we can say that our city are co-city. Co, we are co-maker of our city. Uh, it's not just something yeah, that that's come from mm -hmm. politics. And the last thing is regarding experimentation. The, um, what is at stake is so complex uh, that you need, you need first to start. Uh, small size, even if your project is a, a large-scale project, you start, you, you get learnings, you learn together, and then the next step, you can start the next step. And you use your city as a laboratory for that, mm -hmm. which is a great opportunity it's also for, for company and any of us to generate this new, this new value. So our main focus is to empower these forces and create this right condition to make things How do you assess happen. What, your, what your main priority is on an issue like, like health, which is so important to receive? So it's where it's very important to know where you want to go. For us in Lyon, it's we, what we forecast is an agile city. Uh, where it's practical, where you have a seamless, you know, services for every of us, every of us, not just few of us. Uh, it's a balanced city where we manage really well our resources, but, uh, you know, also the urban uh, growth uh, with a climate impact that is reduced at the minimum. Uh, a creative city, we want to be a creative city, meaning that innovation has to work with creativity and not just, you know, and a, a city where the city is a platform by itself, mm -hmm. a, a platform that says something to the citizen and abroad, and also a human-centric city, meaning that the first question that we raise is how we want to live with technology, we want to investigate education, health, uh, you know, all that, because to, if you want to ask citizen uh, to be part of your project, you need to know what's happened. Okay. So this is a big responsibility that you also have regarding yeah. sales data, for example. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Allow me to jump one, yo, if, if, you, if you are okay, Mayor. Um, what, what is, I mean, you, you have explained to us that you have tried to introduce these this, uh, new technologies, this smart notion in different services in your city for education, for health, for traffic, etc. cetera. Uh, can you tell us what your key priorities are now, for instance, in terms of, of, of security or education uh, related in relation to, to a smart. Can you share a couple of those ideas so that then we can come back to our private sector partners and tell us how they look at that? So using the same data that we gather in the city, we can cooperate with all stakeholders to accelerate uh, solving the problems. So for example, in case of a disaster, 
occurrence because just now I received a report from my staff that there is a wind uh, storm moving to Surabaya city. So these data is spread to the public and then the, the people can directly <coughs> anticipate with this occurrence. So for example, in, in education service, there's no longer the, the parents, no need to be confused uh, for the school enrollment because using this electronic system, then all students can have an easier school enrollment. And also for the school reports and scores every day, every month, and every three months, and every year can also be accessed online. And parents can also check the conditions of their children at school. Well, for the health service, the focus is that the doctor can detect immediately uh, about uh, the medical records of the patients coming to them. Because patients can uh, register to the hospital one week before uh, the appointment uh, with the doctors. Therefore, doctors can't uh, have an immediate response and check the medical record before the patients come to the hospitals. And these medical records can also be opened by other doctors if it is needed in case of emergency because all data uh, from these medical records by the citizens of Surabaya are recorded. Thank very you well. very much, Mayor. So I understand for you the issue of, of technologies is very important in terms of access to information, right? Providing access to, to information uh, to, to, to your citizens. How does that fit into your nervous system, Yo? Yes, I is that access, Is that important? Yes, That's what you want to achieve? Yes, I, I, I think every city, as I heard about Rob and, and Tree here, I, I, I feel that different city has different pains. They'll never be the same. Even if they're similar, okay, their tactics, the focus, the solution would be a little bit different, okay? Uh, based on my, uh, the implementation experience. L let me separate the smart city into three stages, right? The first stage, I call it smart city 1.0, okay, which is like three or four or five years ago, everyone is getting on the internet and, 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 and e-government concept is actually bringing into the ideas. As of today, many government already in the e-government already. Second stage is Smart City 2.0, which is mobile application on the internet. As of today, everyone is using WhatsApp, WeChat, Line, and all these technology, right? The third, Smart City 3.0, which is where I think today we actually at this stage, is the concept of IoT. Right, IoT concept and managing the city through the sense, right, to, to get to, to, to know the well being, what is happening inside the city. So, I want to give an example of what we did. Should you I do that? One minute. I got, okay, one minute. Yep. Uh, we, we, I, I came from a, uh, a city called Longgang, which is like very small city, not a city, a district, with only 4.5 million people. Okay, four and five million people. We we have a uh, we set up an IoT platform. We set up a we set up one cloud, two networks, and three platforms. Okay, to to basically three platform is the data, big data platform, IOC in, in intelligent operations center, and also the uh, the uh, application platform. And after three four years of implementation, okay, of this being able to sense the city, what is happening in the city, and what we have done so far. And I just want to read this out: the uh, the crime rate has dropped 29%. The government efficiency has improved overall is 6%. The lineup used to be lined up in the government, okay, uh, let's say two hours line up, now reduce it to one hour, okay, and they're able to cover more uh, 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 people to come in, 29% uh, raise, okay, in the, and we, we, we have done, we built five clouds, okay, into one. Uh, the first one is police cloud, service public cloud, education cloud, uh, health cloud, okay, and the uh, and one of the cloud I need to is it, it, called public uh, police cloud. So five clouds together, okay, into one platform. So data are being shared, okay, and they can they can collaborate all the data into one ID for the whole city, one windows. So if I'm a citizen, I go to one window, in in the government, I get all my services done. Okay. Okay, that's a good example. Austin, you go to a city, you try, you, 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 you've got these wonderful products that you want to, 
to share with them and, and solutions. And you tell them, this is what I've got, and this is what you should use, or you ask them to define with you what type of product they want. How, how do you deal with that? Yeah, it's a fantastic question because the way that we are trying to establish this platform is very much one of openness. And so when, when we deploy one of these systems at scale, first of all, the city owns the data, 100%. It's their data to govern, build the policies that they need to build, and direct it where they need it to go. Secondly... That's good news, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Secondly, and going back to, to something that, that both Rob and Karen said around innovation and how do we spur this and, and help change the way that cities think about, about implementing these solutions, is there is a growing uh, awareness of the software industry, right? It's the number one growing um, graduate degree in the entire world. And little known fact is that the 40%, 40% of all software developers are hobbyists, which means that in their spare time, they're actually writing code to do interesting things. And so when you think about the opportunity that we're about to unlock in cities, it actually lives in the universities, the incubators, the entrepreneurs, the startups, the small businesses, medium businesses, the local community that has the energy and the innovation and the skill set to build smart city applications are actually going to become part of the equation for solving these problems. Let me ask you one question that comes from the audience. This wonderful app that we have is actually working. So I have here some questions that I want to introduce in this last round okay. so that it's already interactive. Um, do you have a size of city that is the perfect city for investment? Or are we talking only about big cities? I mean, in Asia, everything is very big if you compare it to other parts of the world. But um, I mean, what is the ideal size and what does your business look at? Uh, do, you ha do you look at any city? Because the question from the audience is, yeah. what about the smaller cities? I, it's a fantastic question. And we actually <laughs> don't gauge it on size of city at all. It really, every city has an opportunity to benefit from these type of technologies, um, small, medium, large, extra large. And so what we really look at is how are, the, how are the mayors, how are the leaders of the city thinking about the technology? Who are the ones that are at the cutting edge of wanting to change fundamentally the business? So it's and not about size. Not about size. It's about leadership. And Absolutely. Having leadership. the vision. Is that the same for you? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah? I, I think the size is doesn't really matter. Okay. The solution must well, might scale, be different, it, it could right? be scalable. It could be scalable. Well, I mean, if you have a population of only 2,000 people, that, that would make a big difference because it would, it would cost you a lot more. But I think that, you know, what you're talking about is scalable platforms uh, reasonably. Okay, I would say that that's, that is possible. Right. Another question that I'm getting uh, fr from the audience is um, what type of uh, solutions are we looking for in terms of security? And I would like to look at cities and, and just very quickly, just, just go, I mean, what is your key, uh, your, your, your key investment in terms of, of, of security? It linked to, to a smart, huh? linked to a smart. Uh, absolutely, digital government, smart cities, internet of things, mm -hmm. security becomes big because everything's becoming digital. And digital within the ecosystem, in our case, the city of Toronto, it's no longer on the premises of just the city, but it's really everything that is digitally connected. So in terms of city um, security solutions, it's broad. It's become a portfolio of solutions. Mm -hmm. And the portfolio of solutions has really become, I call it device specific. So in the traditional days of cybersecurity, you were safe for the perimeter. As long as your compound was secured, you were okay. That paradigm has changed. It's now about the pieces that are connected and the information that's changing and the technology that's connected. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're doing it from a risk management perspective. All right. Segregating and organizing a technology footprint and architecture to make sure you create, I call it some safe zones, and applying the level of security that makes sense. We will be in trouble if we're going to drive towards an open and transparent government and locking down everything. We've got to apply the right level of security to the right components. Vice uh, President, do you identify with that? Is there anything else that you would add to the security question? Yeah, in Lyon, we, we took a very specific position on cybersecurity regarding urban and industrial system. 
uh, for two reasons. The first one is because we are the first industrial place in France. So we have, you know, a strong industrial um, features that give rooms for to experiment, you know, how to protect that that system. And secondly, we have um, many a, a great range of uh, local stakeholders that can help to create uh, European clusters regarding that question. What is crazy uh, on where, what we are experiencing today is that internet originally has never been, you know, uh, shaped to be the, the foundation of cities or right. so big things. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, an incredible, crucial question for every of us, uh, company as well as SME, startup, research, and city, mm -hmm. to solve that question for the future. So mm -hmm. we're fully engaged in uh, providing a great contribution uh, on that question. Okay. Um, Someone in the audience has also asked, you've got cities like London, which are introducing uh, a special taxation for diesel cars, etc. Uh, and they are asking whether you, any of you guys are planning to introduce that kind of taxation. I would like to broaden that question a little bit and ask you whether your main health, uh, health challenge is around pollution or traffic or whether you have other challenges on health. You want to start, Mayor? You know, so because all services in Surabaya is using technology, because uh, for example, also in health and transportation system. So I would like to give you an example. So when people would like to uh, ask or issue and board certificate, merit certificate, then they do not need to come to our office, also including for any kinds of licenses. But they can just uh, simply apply it online and we will deliver the documents back to their gadgets or we can also uh, send uh, deliver the hard copy to their home address. Therefore, it significantly reduced uh, the problem in the traffic congestions in the city with the big number of population, you know, 3.3 million people with the economic growth around 7.8 percent. But in fact, we can reduce uh, significantly for the traffic problem in the city. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Traffic mobility remains a very, a, a very big, big challenge. Another question that I have gotten from 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 the audience is. It, it was addressed to, to, to Rob and Karen on um, how many uh, consultants do you work with or private companies do you work with? Uh, I mean, is it many more than, than the percentage of things that you try to do on your own? And I would like you to quickly address that. So whether you are trying to mainly solve that in the local administration or whether you are seeking support. And then I would like to ask our two private partners um, whether they work exclusively with cities or whether they go into cities working with other, with other uh, companies. Okay, so Rob, just to start, just give us a, well, sure. percentage yeah. or try to approach this briefly. Uh, yeah, I'll hit it in 30 seconds. I think it shows a lot that even at this conference we have a, a delegation from the Toronto Region Board of Trade and our Chair of Economic Development, Councillor Michael Thompson, is here today. So he's fostered and catalyzed partnerships. Right. We can't possibly, we don't have the Canada economic alone. budget to try and do it on our own. So through partners that are actually here participating in the Smart Cities Expo mm -hmm. and collaborating with the city that we're able to think big and drive innovation. Okay. It's, it's about the governance issue, right? It's not about one single part of the city doing this? So we, we have a smart that? city roadmap that uh, cover more than 100 experimentation, not just, you know, services as a hand, experimentation. They're all based on the consortium of uh, stakeholders with multiple quality. I mean, uh, big companies, startup, SME, and so, and so on. Uh, that cover more than 400 partners that are engaged in this 100 project in total. And I will say that 90% uh, of this project are funded with private investments, including international investment. Why? Because we generate value. All right. But I mean, there is a part of governance which is very important to keep with the, with the public sector. Yeah. That, that's the idea. And in addition to that, we uh, make sure that 
We give the room for diverse communities to regroup itself, themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you want to activate the voice of citizens, it's much easier to make it happen based on community with a uh, single interest and, you know, with a big mass of mm -hmm. citizens. Okay. Can I insert one quick point, and then I think you triggered right. something there. To build on that, Toronto's a very diverse city and drives uh, diversity as our strength. Mm -hmm. So we've actually modified some of our procurement policies to have what we call social procurement so that we can drive more diversity and inclusion with those many partners that we work with. This is and the changes is in regulation that you were uh, heading towards. Absolutely. Uh, there was a question uh, about that. I so you go into a city and you want to work alone with that city or Mission Impossible? How does that look? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you mean by Mission Impossible? I mean, I think the, the most obstacle the city are facing today is budget. I mean, the budget and visionary, like how are they going to do it? So. Uh, from my perspective, I look at uh, a city, there's no company in the world today that can do smart city on its own. Okay, okay that's, why that's the have, answer then. Yeah. That's, we have to create a, a platform to host other platform, okay, the same as yours, okay. At the same time, we have to create an ecosystem that with different partners, okay. Now, that's where the public, okay, can come in. The, the places that I work with is the funding is the most important part, where the money is coming from, right? I mean. Uh, the funding part is the first one I call PPP, okay, which is adopted by uh, many countries. Uh, there's another model called leasing model. Okay? The leasing model is you, you invest and then you lease it back to the, the government. Okay? Another one is like, managed, uh, it's like managed services model. The, you have to, you have to, it, the most important part here is that you have to have a budget and also a commercial model that can sustain and w then that's where, where the partners can come in to help. Mm -hmm. where the private sector... So you have to have a broader picture and yeah. then you, exactly. you, you start working with the different yeah. partners. How do you approach that, Austin? Yeah, I would echo what Joe said. Um, companies like Huawei and GE, we're big, we can do a lot of things, but we can't do everything. And so it's really important that we establish an ecosystem of partners to help us build these solutions out, specifically software partners, because that's the future. Mm -hmm. Having an ability to enable a city to have a customized app store, just like you have on your mobile device, where you can go and get public safety apps or traffic, parking, environmental applications, is absolutely critical to the speed and scalability. And so not only, um, is it a, it only, not only can companies not do it all on their own, they're actually doing the cities a disservice by trying to take it on on their own. Mm -hmm. And I think it also misses the point of unlocking the innovation that can come from the local community right. to actually build those solutions. Have you ever worked on a solution? This is another question that comes from the audience. Have you ever worked on a solution that you then found citizens didn't really want to use? And I wanted to ask the mayor of Surabaya whether you are concerned that some of the services that you are offering through these platforms are services that not everybody can use because they cannot access them. So a little bit of a term. But how, the question was, how do you convince citizens to use a service? I, when I read the question, I thought, isn't that a problem if you need to convince people to use a service? Then uh, you might be providing the wrong service. There, there's something wrong there. But how, uh, have you faced something, something like that, Austin? Yeah. So a first reaction and then the mayor. And look at this thing. It says nine minutes, so we need to wrap up. One minute. So one of, the, one of the wonderful things that we've done over the past year is engage in these events called hackathons, where we bring local talent in with actual code, actual sensor technologies, and they build apps right there on the spot. Within two days, they drink a lot of Red Bull and eat a lot of brownies and cookies, and they just code all night for two days, and they build an application with one use case that helps solve a challenge for a city. And the city officials come in after two days, and they judge the applications, and they'll take one, and they'll go test it. If they don't like it, they'll test another one, and then they'll test another one. So having that flexibility. Any last thought you want to leave for the general wrap-up? Because I want to give you a last word to all of you. Any last thought that you would like to give to the audience? I think it's really about thinking about Re helping cities repurpose their infrastructure to create that digital backbone to extract data and enable the software application uh, customization of the future. Mayor, universal access versus a smart. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Yeah, so the, the citizens of Surabaya is very happy with all these programs because one thing is there will be no more 
like illegal retribution charged to them by using this electronic system and everything becomes uh, faster and more transparent and they can directly um, control uh, the progress of uh, the projects that they are uh, proposing to us or any information that they would like to know, to know that everything is on time. Okay, thank you. I, Last I, I promise to share with you some of the success. Why? What are successful factors? Okay, so I'm going to use it as my final statement. I think what you need to is to define the strategy and vision that is important. Okay, the second thing, and this is extremely important, I saw a lot of failure in the smart city uh, projects. Okay, it's because they're not strong enough. So you need a strong leader, a strong government, a strong leader to be also in as a part of your working team. That is very important. Budget. Okay, money, where the money is coming from. You need a focused team, a dedicated team, no part-timers, please, okay? Otherwise, it just wouldn't work. Also, identify a sustaining business model where the funding is coming in, build up the commercial model, PPP, leasing model, managed services model. You need to define right at the beginning how you're gonna run it, okay? And at the end of the day, you also need a digital partner, okay, like Huawei and GE, and a, 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 a partner that are capable, have experience to help you to build the ecosystem and create a platform to host whatever you want to do. Okay. Um, last thoughts, Vice President? Uh, what can I say? I will say that the path to smartness is for me a combination of three dimensions. First, you have this uh, first level that is empowering data. And for that, we need as a local government to be experts also on that question, yeah. not just to give, you know, company uh, say to you what you yeah. have to do. It's why it's important to have on board, you know, people like you or chief data officer that can, you know, really tell where to go. And we need to create, obviously, is a tool for that. In Lyon, we create a data platform that is, um, that can, you know, host private and public data. But in addition to that, we create also a tool that is a tube, a living lab, that is entry point for any company, any citizen, any startup that want to generate a, a new project with in the spirit of collaboration to propose it and to turn data into innovation of services. In addition to that, you have this collaborative approach that is a, that is a fundamental layer. Make sure that you have on board all you need, all this creative force that can make you make your city better and, and um, and, and smarter. And the last thing is to play with your asset, your DNA, your culture, you know, what is very specific, specific to you. And not try to, you know, stick to this model, this standard model that to be the first city in the world to be smart. That's, that's not the point. This is just a sequence in your history. And you, may, you need to make it smart regarding to what you was in the past and what you want you to want be in to the become. future. I love that. <laughs> say, say, For us, a uh, couple closing say. comments. Uh, never lose sight of your purpose. <coughs> As our city, our purpose is to improve the quality of life for people that live, work, and play in the city of Toronto um, through economic prosperity, environmental sustainability, and social advocacy. Number two, leadership is key. We've seen an example of a change of leadership from even from an elected official perspective. Having strong leadership that doesn't lose sight of the purpose, that can drive out measurable results is really critical. And again, I can't emphasize the importance of that in having leadership participate in things like this. Uh, number three, with the size of Toronto and the proliferation, we just look at this expo, there's so many solutions out there. Don't get lost in the technology, focus on outcomes. Take an approach that is based on measurable return on investment. Not all of it has to be quantified by dollars, but it may be driving service excellence. But if you don't take that focus, you will get lost in the options and actually lose sight of your purpose. Thank you very much. Well, it has been a great pleasure for me to facilitate this session. We live, we live in a very unique moment for humanity where most of us are living in, in urban centers where the connections between urban and rural are very vague now. There is a continuation, so the rural-urban divide is, is a dichotomy that we probably shouldn't be working with anymore, where we have global agendas which are, for the first time, universal. They are not uh, uh, development agendas for the global north or for the global south, but they are shared agendas, and the Paris Agreement and the uh, Sustainable Development Goals is one of them. We are convinced in networks like ours, United Cities and local 
local governments with 100 years of history that there is no single authority that can deal with problems alone, that there is no single stakeholder that can address that, and this panel has emphasized this really. We've also stressed that problems that affect our communities need to be built from the local experience and local needs, from that identity that the vice, may, uh, the, the vice president of Lyon was, uh, was describing, but also that we, uh, we need to work uh, with broader partnerships, different types of partnerships. And I'm very happy that the both private sector uh, stakeholders that have joined us here today also realize they need also political leadership to actually make things happen and innovate, because that is what is helping us um, uh, make, uh, transform things. So uh, we will need to work on our democracies in the way that people participate. We will need to work on the way that we are funding things. Uh, I mean, I think the, the financing of development is a very important issue that we need to look at. And I think multi-level governance and the relation between the different spheres of governments will be extremely important also for the establishment of smart plans that are related to, to, to resilience. Um, and finally, um, we should not forget that unless we have a very good idea of where we want to go, it will be very difficult for us to define the strategy that answers the needs of, of, of the citizens. So I thank you very much for this uh, visionary panel. I hope the audience enjoyed it. We cannot see your faces, so it's a little bit difficult. Uh, we are exactly on time, and we thank you very much for your attention this morning, and thank you for the questions. They were great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.